Other questions? Hold on one moment. I need to come stand next to you, I'm afraid. Okay, hold on one second. You ready? Okay, just, you're okay. Yeah. Uh, how do you verify the, the, the rea rea reality of data that uh, uh, come to different person in French. Comment vous vérifiez la fiabilité des données qui viennent de different person? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, essentially, when we have a data record, um, how are we going to come to trust that data record? Um, it may be collected a century ago, it may be co collected by someone that we have no knowledge of. Um, so it's a very difficult thing because many times in science we prefer to collect our own data. Right? I go out into the field and I collect my own data. But in this biodiversity informatics world, as you say, we have to trust somebody. Trust the original a uh, person who, who captured that data record. And so we'll be talking, in one whole day of this um, course, we'll be talking about uh, error flagging, data cleaning, and data <coughs> consistency. But essentially what we look for are some very clear signals of problems. There, there are things where I can just look at a map and I can point to whole classes of problems. And then on a finer scale, we can look for consistency within the data record. So for example, we might describe a locality in terms of geographic coordinates, latitude and longitude, and also give a description of the country and the state and the municipality where the, the record was collected. And so we can ask whether the geographic coordinates are consistent with the textual description of that record. And so that's essentially looking for internal consistency in our data record. And then we can go one step farther and we can look for external consistency. We can essentially ask whether that record gives us the same sort of signal as other records of biodiversity or of that species. So can we find every error? Can we um, detect and correct every problem in the data? Definitely not. But we can at least seek a set of records that show consistency and don't conflict with one another. And so that's a process we're going to talk about a lot in the, in the course of this week and a half. OK? <coughs> Moses. Yes. My question is. Speak loud. Yeah, my question is, will it, will it be a better practice to transcribe your primary data into publications because it will if you transcribe in publication you can now you can now designate them to different websites and a lot of people will get to know to know it rather than because in that case you will, I think you will not have problems with politicians in your country. Can it be a good practice? It's a very interesting question. And you know other experts if you have opinions please throw them out. Uh, my personal opinion is that when we, you said, transcribe our primary, primary data primary into publications, publications, in some sense that is, is moving away from the primary record. So, for example, I might you know, do a publication on the plant community. Of course, I wouldn't. I'm not a botanist. 
Um, but I might do a publication on the plant community of a particular site. Well, I may end up losing information because maybe when I say a particular site, I go from you know, GPS records that puts the plant there, 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 and there to saying this site has that species. But I have finer resolution data that go into that opinion of part of the community or not. So in a publication, you rarely have the, uh, the possibility of publishing all of the information in your data record. My personal opinion is better to share the unitary, primary, original data in its fundamental form. You know, a publication is good either for calling attention to the data, right? essentially announcing to the broader community that the real data exists, or in synthesizing and interpreting. Again, I, I personally would argue against the idea of what are being called data papers. That's my opinion. It's not the only opinion. Okay, come on. I thought I could get a rise out of you. I have an alternative opinion. There we go. I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I disagree with what Town says for a lot of the projects that are out there, a lot of the purposes. But I think there are certain cases where that might actually benefit of going through publications. And this is something that will come up in some of my lectures as well, is especially when we talk about, let's say, invertebrates, insects, in my case. There's so much unknown diversity out there that whatever we're databasing, for example, very often gets databased not down to the species level. Or, you know, if it does, there's high error rates in there because uh, collections haven't been looked at by the experts. So there's people out there who have argued that the real trustworthy biodiversity data for insect specimens, I'm not saying that's true for the vertebrate world, it might be less true for plants as well, but for insects and other invertebrates, it will be true in many cases, are those data actually coming out of what we would call taxonomic revisions. So those are big projects that you know, experts on a particular taxon, a group of organisms, they would come gather all the specimens, not only from one collection or one country, but for the entire revision they're working on. And they look at every last single specimen, make, make sure that the identifications are correct, describe new species if there is new species. And then the specimen data that are published in these publications, in these revisions, those are the real prime data, essentially. Obviously, you will argue, well, people do revisions that, you know, that one example I'm going to be showing, um, those two uh, researchers looked at 1,500 specimens, and you go, well, that's nothing, right? There's other revisions that look at maybe 12,000 specimens. That's still a small number of specimens, obviously. But, you know, there's a certain benefit. And then there's other projects that wouldn't really say you want to go directly you know, through a publication, but it would still be very, very, very concerned about that whole identification thing. And I think the project we're working on, for example, shows some of the avenues of dealing with that. So I would say you know, it, it depends, really. So there are certain things where I think, you know, go to the, do a publication. And then, oh yeah, the last thing I wanted to say on that. So you have, we saw Suki's for, um, before. And there's a lot of journals out there now that make it very straightforward to get the biodiversity data, for you to harvest the biodiversity data out of these publications. So it's not just a printed PDF with what we in taxonomy would call material methods or material examined, which is not tagged in any way. So you can't really easily access it. But journals like Zookeys actually allow you to, everything in there is has a tag, essentially, in such ways that it becomes very easy to pull that information out. Prime data and easy to get out, so. So, just to, I mean, uh, this is stuff that interests me quite a bit. Come this way so that you're in the picture. Um, <laughs> what, so I, I'm totally in agreement with essentially linking taxonomic revisions to the data that underlie them. That, that's, you know, very clear to me. 
But what about these just straight out data papers where, you know, I as curator of birds at the University of Kansas announced that we're going to put our data from our egg collection yeah. online. <clears throat> no, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would never do that either just because I think at a stage we're at, and again, I'm, I'm always speaking from the entomology perspective sure. of things. Obviously, we've, you know, there were enough projects out there that show that no matter what database, for example, you use, it becomes very straightforward and easy, or it has become very straightforward and easy over the last five to ten years to just take data and put them out, and then there's these data aggregators like GBIF or other um, other entities that just grab all that data. So I would say, like, yeah, no, I would never do that. I would never, you know, just inventory all the specimens we have in our collection and, and publish put it, it in. Yeah, yeah, publish that. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's not very useful. It's not the best way, I think, of of making data available. So my question is, uh, sometimes, okay, the, an example here. I visited the Tavuren Museum in uh, Belgium and tried to digitize the, the specimen in the correction. So I noticed that some, a, huge, a huge data is not only erroneously done, but uh, even most, most specimens are not properly identified. And in some countries, like where, where I am, some, some taxa are ignored. Um, they, they are no experts to certain taxa. And you have huge lots of correction material that's not even identified. And uh, what we are trying to do is to get these specimens, do some material transfer agreements, and take them to world authorities and experts elsewhere outside the country for ident proper identification so that we can have the, the, right, the right data and the right identification mm -hmm. for these specimens. Mm -hmm. So for this case, maybe a similar scenario might happen to another country where you have material that that's a nobody, no, nobody is able to identify and you want to capture this data. How, how are the plans for this, this initiative to capture such data? Where you have no expert, right, right. you have no expertise, no tax, taxonomic uh, guys who can do proper mm -hmm. identification. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can take the specimens to another country for identification, then they return the material so that we can uh, harmonize the data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as the right so identification. So that, that's a very good set of questions. Um, Sometimes material is not worked because of lack of funds or lack of time. Sometimes for lack of expertise. Um, and sometimes even for lack of interest. Um, and essentially that to me is an initiative of the individual taxonomic community and different communities will work in different ways. So for example, um, in some communities it's very easy to do detailed images and the images can be shared very conveniently. In other communities I've seen um, institutions get funding to bring in the specialists. And you know, if, if a person is a specialist on this genus, Maybe, maybe the institution says to that person, we'd like you to come and visit us for two weeks. You know, you do your research, but we would really like it if you would leave this whole genus identified correctly. But you have to separate the identifications from capturing the information. You capture the information properly, and you have a qualifier as to how confident are we of these identifications? But the documentary information is out there. And so sometimes, and I do this frequently with birds, sometimes an expert can look at the data record from far away and say, you know, the true name of that is this. And sometimes the expert needs hands 
on the specimen. But again, I think that is something that the institution needs to solve or something that the community needs to solve, the group of people who work on a particular taxon. And in some sense, we can separate that from getting the information into existence with proper description of how sure are we of those identifications. Okay, so we can, we can to some degree separate out those two dimensions of the question. What is the information and what is the best possible, most accurate identification? But it's a very, very good question and a very big challenge in the field. Get a different opinion. Not really a different opinion. But what I see here that's very relevant to this course is the, an opportunity that you'll have more difficulty in getting experts engaged if they don't know that the material is even there. But there are experts out there and they're dying for material because that's their lifeblood. So now, if you digitize as much as you can, including images, and publish those, you basically created a shopping mall for interesting information and can invite those experts then easily because they know that you have those data that now it's accessible. It's accessible for the experts to, to engage and to see that it's actually there. Uh, and now you have a way probably to, to access those resources because they know, they know there's actually something of interest which they might not have known before. So all of a sudden, you work with scorpions, correct? Yes. Okay. It's Maybe you see... Not well understood. In, in, no, of in course it. not. Uh -huh. But maybe there's a collection of thousands of, of East African scorpions mm -hmm. in some small university in, I don't know, Western Spain. Mm -hmm. And as John said, if you don't know of the existence of that, mm -hmm. you can't do anything about it. So capturing that basic information, even if it just says unidentified scorpion, is very, very useful because then an expert can say, oh, wow, unidentified scorpion from Tanzania. I need to go to that collection. Okay, so it's, it's the shopping mall, right? We don't always have to go out into the field to do new taxonomic and biodiversity work. Sometimes, somebody already did the work for us. Okay? Sometimes it get involved it involves even going back to the to the, to the specific point and see whether you can correct the a similar material. Of course. And do the right the right uh, data capture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs>